appreciate Brother Daniel reading this passage from Exodus chapter 3. Because this is where Moses sees the burning bush. Exodus 3 is where Moses has already left Egypt and gone to uh, the land of Midian. And he is on the mountain tending the sheep. And he sees the burning bush. And he goes to see what it is. And God tells him to take off his sandals because where he is standing is holy ground. And this is God's message to him speaking from that burning bush. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. I have seen the oppression of the Israelites in Egypt. And I'm going to send you to Pharaoh to bring my people out. To bring my people out of slavery. To bring my people out of their bondage. Where they have been now in Egypt for 400 years. And in bondage apparently most of that time. It's very, very important for us to understand. When we study the Old Testament. When we study the Exodus. When we study the wanderings in the wilderness, when we study the conquering of the promised land in the book of Joshua, that what we are looking at is a story of a people that symbolizes and teaches us about our own lives and about our own faith. And I think that we see that over and over again, that the Egyptian bondage of the Israelites is used to teach us about different forms of bondage in our own lives. It's used to teach us about the bondage of sin. And it's used to teach us about the triumph over sin. It's used to teach us about the release from the slavery of sin or whatever other type of slavery that we have fallen victim to. You know, the Bible says in 2 Peter 2.18, for by what? A man is overcome by this, he is enslaved. There are many different forms of bondage. There are many different forms of slavery. It's not just human ownership, but it's being held back by something in your life. Are you enslaved? Is there something? That holds you back. What is it. That prevents. Your success. What is it. That prevents you. From enjoying all the fruit. And all the bounty. Of God's blessings. And God's kingdom. What is it. That prevents your freedom. To enjoy all the wonderful things. That God has prepared for you. It takes a lot of different forms. For some people, it's addiction. And for some of those people, it's a very obvious and unmistakable form of addiction. Things like alcohol or drugs or gambling or immoral behavior. For other people, they are addicted to things that are not as obvious. And some people don't even realize. What's ruining their lives? What's preventing their success and their joy? I've seen people addicted to sports. I've seen people addicted to recreation. I've seen people addicted to work. I've seen people addicted to shopping. I've seen people addicted to Craigslist. I've seen people addicted to Facebook. What in your life? If anything, holds you back. What in your life prevents you from enjoying God's promises? Let's look at the story of the Israelites being released from the captivity in Egypt. And I think we can understand some basic principles for what will allow us to escape the captivity that holds us back in whatever form it may exist. If you come forward to chapter 4, you see that initially the Israelites are very pleased to hear that God has heard about their suffering. Uh, Exodus, Exodus chapter 4, verse 31. Moses has now gone back to Egypt. He has met Aaron. Aaron has come out to meet him. 
And now they've gone to meet with the Israelites, uh, the elders of the Israelites. And in verse 31, so the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel, that he had seen their affliction, then they bowed low and worshipped. The possibility of freedom is a wonderful thing. The understanding that God cares about your life. The understanding that God cares about your problems. That God cares about the thing that holds you down or holds you back. It's inspired. It's invigorated. But what happens next is often in the other direction. If you come forward to chapter 5, verse 21, Pharaoh has now seen Moses. Moses has now gone to Pharaoh and he says, we want to go three days into the wilderness to sacrifice to the Lord our God. Pharaoh calls in the taskmasters. He calls in the men who oversee the slaves of the Israelites. And he says, I want you to take away their straw and continue to make them make as many bricks. And so they do that. And then the Israelites come to Pharaoh and they said, you don't, you're not going to believe what your taskmasters have done. They've taken away our straw and told us we still have to make as many bricks. Pharaoh says, well, I heard you wanted to go worship. You're just lazy. Get your own straw and make as many bricks. The Israelites come back to Moses in chapter 5, verse 21. And here's what they say. May the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. To overcome slavery, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to learn to hate slavery. You've got to learn to despise the situation in which you are. The Israelites were happy that freedom was possible, but they were very displeased by the method required to bring them out of Egypt. It's nice to say, I want to be free. But the process of obtaining that freedom is usually unpleasant. It usually involves increased difficulty at first. And you have to learn to look at your situation for what it really is. You have to learn to see how powerless you really are. You have to learn to see that something else has control over you and is making you miserable. And you have to learn to want to break that control. The Israelites weren't there yet. They wanted the freedom. But when they start the process of breaking the control, they complain. God says he wants to make us free, but now we complain about his method for doing that. I've got bad news. It got even worse. It wasn't just the straw that made things worse. After this happens, Moses starts telling Pharaoh and God starts bringing the plagues on Egypt. Did you know that the first four plagues struck the Israelites as well? <coughs> not only are they enslaved, not only are they having to find their own straw and make as many bricks, but now they're also suffering the same plagues as the Egyptians. But what God is doing is he's making them want to leave. He's teaching them that, he, that they must learn to hate their situation. They must learn to want desperately to be free. If you come forward to Exodus chapter 8, Exodus chapter 8, verses 22 and 23. Moses tells us that it was the first four plagues that attacked them. And the first four plagues were the water being turned to blood, the frogs, and the gnats. Actually, that's the first three. But then the fourth one is different. I said that wrong. It's the first three. Verse 22 of Exodus 8. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people are living, so that no swarms of insects will be there, nor that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign will occur. Then the Lord did so, and there came great swarms of insects into the house of Pharaoh and the houses of his servants, and the land was laid waste because of the swarms of insects in all the land of Egypt. That's the first time that God distinguishes between the Egyptians and the Israelites. Here's the point. To 
break free, it's unpleasant. To break free from slavery is hard. Amen. It's difficult. And when you first begin the process, it's especially difficult. It's especially painful. It's especially harsh. And that harshness and that difficulty tempts your mind to say, I'd rather stay where I am. I'd rather just stay enslaved is go through the difficulty of freedom. But then you know what happens. Plague after plague after plague comes until finally the Passover happens and the firstborn in every household is put to death, except for ones with the blood above the doorpost. Pharaoh says, get out! And so they gather up, they borrow things from the Egyptians, and they leave. 600,000 men, maybe as many as 2 million people, leave Egypt and start marching through the desert. What happens when you finally make that break? What happens when you finally take a bold step to break the bonds of whatever is holding you captive? It chases you. It comes after you. It tries to pull you back in. That's exactly what Pharaoh does. He sees what they're doing, and God manipulates him into doing this, but Pharaoh sends his army to recapture his slaves. He catches up to them close to the Red Sea, God separates them. He puts a barrier between the Israelites. And then Moses holds out the rod. God divides the water. It says they walk through the Red Sea with walls of water on both sides. Somebody sent me a, a cartoon not too long ago where the Israelites were walking through the Red Sea. And there's a shark or some kind of huge fish with his head sticking out of the wall of water biting a man's hand. And Moses says, I told you not to get too close to the water. The point is, it would be extremely frightening to walk through that water, to walk between those walls of water. But that's what you've got to do. You've got to go forward and not go back. And it's frightening. But if you do it, and if you follow God's path, he breaks the enslavement. He breaks the bonds. He frees you from the captivity. Which brings us to our second point. Now you've got to go to the mountain of God. You've got to go to Mount Sinai. Come forward to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, an amazing thing takes place. God delivers the Ten Commandments to the people. And when we think about the events regarding the giving of the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law at Mount Sinai, we think of Moses on top of the mountain receiving the tablets and coming down and breaking the tablets and having to cut more stones and go back up and have the tablets made again. But before any of that takes place, God speaks to the people directly. And Exodus 20 records that, where God gives the Ten Commandments verbally in the hearing of all the people. And then after that's over, verse 18, the people react. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But let not God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, and in order that the fear of Him may remain with you, so that you may not see. When you come out of captivity, when you come out of bondage, you've got to replace it with righteousness. You've got to replace it with that which is good. And these people come to Mount Sinai, and Mount Sinai is covered in a thick black cloud, apparently black. And it quakes, and it thunders, and there's lightning, and there's smoke billowing from the top of the mountain. And this trumpet blast, and the voice of God Almighty speaks to the people, and the people are terrified. And Moses explains, God is doing this because he wants to make an impression. 
God is doing this to underscore the importance of understanding his might and respecting his authority. When you obtain the freedom that God provides from the bondage, you've then got to come to God's mountain and embrace his authority. You've got to come to God's mountain and embrace his power. That is the process of escaping captivity. As you know, this Israelite generation did that extremely poorly. In fact, they failed at it completely and were wiped out in the wilderness and never reached that land flowing with milk and honey that God described to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Their children got there. The next generation got there. But not the ones who came out of Egypt. Third. Besides learning to hate your captivity, besides coming to the mountain of God and embracing his power, you've got to attack your enemies. You've got to assault the fortresses that stand between you and the blessings of God. You've got to come to conquer the promised land. Where are you in this continuum? Some people here today have yet to learn to hate their situation. They have yet to learn the absolute degradation of a life away from God. The absolute destruction that always results when you don't entrust yourself to your Creator. Other people have realized that. And they have come to God and sought his freedom and dealt with the captivity of sin, dealt with the bonds of iniquity in their lives. They have come to the mountain of God and embraced the word of God and the instructions of God and the authority of God. But have yet to assault those bastions that stand between them and the blessings in God's promised land. And that's the third thing that you have to do. Not only do you have to come to Mount Sinai, after Mount Sinai, you've got to go to Canaan. And you've got to cross that Jordan River. And you've got to attack Jericho and Ai and all of those other cities that are listed. You have to pull down those fortresses and do the hard work of conquering those things in your mind and in your life that stand between you and God's blessings. And it's frightening. There's a lot of fear. What will this do to my relationships? How will my family react when I change that part of my life? When I stop doing that, when I stop saying that, when I start telling people what I believe, how will they treat me? What will happen to my job? What will happen in my marriage? What will happen in my relationship with my parents? What will happen in my relationship with my children? What will happen with my relationship with my friends? What am I giving up? What am I sacrificing if I take these steps? There's a lot of fear. Turn with me to the book of Joshua. Seven times, at least seven times, that I could find in the book of Joshua. <coughs> God, through inspiration, tells Joshua either to not be afraid or to be courageous and strong or both. And Joshua is the account of the Israelites conquering the promised land. And in my opinion and the opinion of some others, it is the absolute height of faith in the, story, in the account of the Israelite people. It is the time at which the nation of Israel is the most faithful and the most successful in their walk with God. <clears throat> look with me at Joshua chapter 1. We're going to go through these quickly. I'm going to show you all seven, but we're going to look at them quickly. Joshua chapter 1, verse 6. Be strong and courageous. This is God talking to Joshua. Very next verse. Only be strong and very courageous. Two verses later, verse 9 of Joshua 1. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do 
not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Here's God's message. I'm with you. I'm telling you to do it. Don't be afraid. It's like this. Choose not to be afraid. Choose to be strong and courageous because I've given you every reason to be. Come forward. Joshua chapter 8, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear or be dismayed. Joshua chapter 10, verse 8. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not one of them shall stand before you. Joshua 10, verse 25. Do not fear or be dismayed. Be strong and courageous, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies with whom you fight. Joshua 11, verse 6. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid because of this, for tomorrow at this time I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. Seven times God says, Be strong and courageous, or do not be afraid. Do not fear. Over and over and over, do not fear. Fear. That's God's message for his people. Underlying that message is the reason. And the reason is, I'm with you. You've got nothing to be afraid of. I'm with you. I will give you the victory. You've got nothing to be afraid of. But you've got to go. You've got to fight. You've got to attack. You've got to work. You've got to conquer. But you're going to win. You're going to win because I'm going to give you the victory. Do not be afraid. Only be strong and very courageous. That formula will allow you, through the power of God, to conquer anything in your life that stands between you and the full abundant life that God has prepared for you, that Jesus has called you. If you don't enjoy the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, if you don't enjoy the contentment that comes through service to God, if you don't enjoy the gain to which godliness is a means toward, then you need to think about what's holding you back. And you need to think about where you are on this continuum. Are you still stuck in this slavery? Have you yet to bow down at the mountain of God when you hear his word? Have you yet to attack the enemies that stand between you and God's blessings? There is great reward. There is a promised land for eternity. There is heaven in which you will be in God's presence forevermore. But there is also an abundant life here. There is peace and love and contentment, and joy that abounds in the life of the faithful. If you don't have it, examine why not and do something about it. The reward is far, far greater than the cost. Amen. If you need to have the bonds of sin broken in your life, Jesus has provided the means to buy you out of sleep, to purchase you from your master, and to set you free, and to give you the freedom to become his voluntary slave. A slave that's lifted to the highest position and given a wonderful life in his service. A life that endures to eternity. If you need that freedom today, take advantage of what he's done. Put your faith in Jesus. Confess your faith. Repent of your sins. Be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. If you need to come to Christ, if you need to return to Christ, please come down front as we stand and sing.